All right, good morning, everybody. It is now nine o'clock, so we're going to begin with some introductions. Thank you for joining us this Monday morning for our Stone Fruit IPM webinar. My name is Mike Baysdow, and I am a tree fruit extension specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. So our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Art Agnolo. He is a tree fruit entomologist at Geneva Agritech. And I'm going to switch my screen over to him and he can get us into the insect portion. Thanks very much, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you. And thanks to, uh, uh, thanks to Mike and Janet for setting this up. And I'm glad that uh, we have so many uh, people with us here. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you, as Mike said, uh, I'm uh, uh, Art Agnello. I'm a, tree, I'm a tree fruit entomologist based here in Geneva at Cornell Agritech. And I'll be talking to you about uh, insect and mite pest control in stone fruits. Um, we have uh, quite a few uh, insect and mite pests that attack uh, all of these uh, crops. Not quite as many as in apples, but still uh, there, are, there are enough to keep everyone busy and, uh, and some of them can be a real challenge. Um, I'm gonna start out with uh, European red mite, which is a pest that most people don't consider usually to be too much of a, of a problem in stone fruits. But in fact, <clears throat> they can develop into a, a considerable problem uh, uh, cer certain years, especially uh, if you have hot and dry summers, uh, which we do tend to get, and particularly uh, in peaches. Um, if you've got a, an orchard that's had a history of problems uh, with uh, red mites, uh, you can sort of anticipate what you might uh, uh, find this year uh, with regard to those uh, mites. Uh, if, even now, if you went out there and looked for the overwintering eggs, um, you'll be able to see them on the, uh, on the, the, the bark, uh, the, the spurs, and in the bud scales. And these are bright red eggs. They look somewhat like paprika. And uh, if you can see them, uh, that's basically an indication that you've got a pretty good population and you, and you might want to uh, keep them in mind and maybe even take some preventive measures uh, before we uh, start the season. And I'll get into that in a second. Uh, also, obviously, during the, su during the summer, you, uh, it's a good, good idea, as it always is, to inspect your foliage uh, to be sure you're not getting some infestations building up. Um, we don't have thresholds that are quite as precise in uh, stone fruits as we do for apples. Uh, basically, uh, the, the presence of eggs or modal forms um, on, the, on the foliage is a good indication that you need to take some treatment uh, uh, action. Uh, I will say that peaches are a little more tolerant of uh, mite populations than apples are. Um, so if you have um, uh, somewhere upwards of 20 modal forms uh, running around on your leaves, one, 20 per leaf, let's say, uh, that's, that's a treatable population. Uh, and and you'll, after that, you'll soon start to see some uh, bronzing and, and uh, damage to the leaf itself. So control tactics available to you. Um, a dormant oil application at bud burst is a very good idea. Uh, because uh, it, it will uh, smother the eggs that are out there now, and uh, it's, it's impossible for mites to get resistant to this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, treatment. Uh, you can use oil, or you can use uh, an ovicide such as Apollo or Savvy, uh, even up as late as June, because even at that point uh, in early June, you're still dealing primarily with um, uh, the egg forms of the of the mites. Uh, later on in the season, uh, if you do get to uh, into a situation where you need a rescue treatment, we do have a number of products available um, that are suitable for that. Uh, acromite or banter, they're, they're the same uh, active ingredient, which is uh, etoxazole. Uh, we have zeal, magister, and portal. Uh, and uh, in peaches and plums only, uh, there's nexter. Uh, not labeled for uh, in-season use on uh, the other stone fruits like cherries or apricots. So at any rate, that's, uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. Cherries occasionally get um, uh, European red mite problems. Uh, and you could also, it, it doesn't hurt you to look um, at, the, um, uh, at, at the buds and uh, foliage on those um, trees as well. Uh, but peaches tend to get them worse. All right, so moving now to the more um, 
troublesome insects, which are those that feed directly on the fruits and cause uh, that unmarketable, un 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 unacceptable damage. Uh, we have uh, three primary pests, three key pests in peaches. Um, plum curculio, which you see does uh, uh, this kind of uh, scarring, a sunken scarring type of damage, can deform the fruit if it's serious enough. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's fairly characteristic, uh, difficult to confuse with other kinds of fruit damage, um, such as oriental fruit moth, which is uh, the key pest, I would say, in, uh, in peaches. Uh, very serious damage because it's an internal feeder, and so you get the, these messy wounds uh, that have the gumosis and some frass in the gum uh, coming out of the wound at the side, in the side of the fruit. Tarnished plant bug also attacks peaches along with many other uh, crops. Uh, in, in peaches, uh, this kind of, uh, it, does, it does a cat facing damage if the attack occurs during the early part of the season, uh, like uh, petal fall or early or, or pink, let's say, earlier than that, uh, just when you're starting to get the buds forming. But uh, later on in the season, you get this uh, fruit scarring, which is nevertheless uh, unacceptable uh, damage as well. So in terms of uh, managing plum curculio, um, it's not really practical to try to monitor for them, but just to be aware that after you get uh, one or two evenings that are uh, 60 degrees or warmer, after the shug split or around the shug split uh, timing, uh, the, the um, adults will be active in the orchard and they'll be starting to lay eggs. And so you may start to see some egg laying scars. And uh, if you're seeing that, um, then uh, that's an indication that you really need to uh, attend to them. As I said, there's not, uh, it's not really a hard and fast rule um, for um, making a treatment decision. Basically, uh, if you get, if you're at the appropriate uh, uh, bud development stage and you have the right weather conditions, uh, you're, you're essentially in plum curculio um, territory. And so, and that's, that's fairly, you know, um, uh, normal for most um, uh, farms in, in uh, New York, most, most places where peaches are grown. Um, so control tactics, we have some good options available um, at Petalfall, uh, Imidan, Actara, Avant, XRL, they're all very good. And also because uh, oriental fruit moth, uh, first generation larvae are generally hatching along in this time, uh, these um, products that are asterisk, the Imidan, Avant, and XRL also do double duty in um, uh, controlling OFM during this uh, time of the season. So that's something to keep in mind for your treatment decisions. Uh, if you're an organic grower, uh, Surround is an option uh, to, to be used against plum curculio. It's not the best material, but it's, it is uh, fairly effective. You know, it needs to be reapplied frequently if you get rain, uh, rainy period. Uh, it's certainly better than doing nothing. Um, now, the plum curculio only has so much egg laying capacity uh, every year in the, in the mated females, and it's uh, temperature uh, related. So, uh, work that's been done by researchers has determined that developmental work has determined that uh, the overposition uh, period uh, goes for quite a while, but really after about uh, 300 and some odd, 308 degree days, base 50, after the petal fall of apples, so as a sort of a um, uh, rule of thumb, a ballpark rule of thumb, if you know the petal fall date of uh, Macintosh in your area, something like mid-May usually, uh, you can, you can uh, extend the sprays until 308 degree days uh, past that point. Um, the, the insects would still be able to lay eggs, but at that point, they really stop moving into the orchards. Uh, they sort of hang out in the woods and in other places where they where they um, develop uh, past that point. So uh, what this generally translates into is that uh, if, if we have a warm and dry spring, uh, you might need two sprays overall, so petal fall and, and one uh, 10 to 14 days later. If we have a really cold and rainy and wet spring, uh, things slow down, including the plum curculio biology, and so uh, it, it could require three sprays. Okay, moving now to oriental fruit moth, which is the nominal, really the key pest 
in uh, insect pest in peaches. Uh, this is a, a tortricid moth. The adult is rather small and um, gray and mottled and fairly in, indistinctive. Um, but uh, it flies uh, starting early in the season, uh, uh, late April to early May, and um, they lay their eggs singly uh, on or near uh, the fruits or the fruit buds. And uh, the insect uh, larvae, uh, when they hatch, uh, they initially, in the first generation, they initially go after uh, the terminals, the growing terminals, and they tunnel inside uh, and, and have this kind of a hollowed out effect uh, on the shoots, uh, which causes the, the leaves on the shoot to flag. Now, this isn't necessarily a direct um, threat or compromise to the, to the, the fruit crop uh, at this point, but it is a good indication that you have a, a population present that's going to need some management. And, and most orchards do require some management of oriental fruit moth. Here's a photo of uh, the uh, early stage larvae, larva, uh, as it uh, uh, develops, it, it burrows into the flesh and it causes this uh, nasty uh, kind of damage that gums, gums up and uh, uh, causes uh, unacceptable damage uh, basically to the, to the fruit flesh. Um, by the time you get to the second generation, the second flight of uh, oriental fruit moth, this can occur generally about early July. Uh, they start going after the newly developing fruits and, and they will uh, bore into the side and begin feeding. And you can uh, easily tell that you have an infested fruit because you get this nasty damage um, uh, with the, uh, the gum and the frass uh, coming out of the wound. Uh, and uh, by the time you get to the, you know, the, the fruit later in development, closer to harvest, the damage is, is even more apparent uh, with uh, very unacceptable um, uh, wounds and uh, injury sites all over the fruits. So, uh, treatment options, management options. Well, the first thing you, you really would like to do is uh, get some pheromone traps out there and monitor for that first adult flight of the season because this allows you to sort of set the developmental clock uh, in your area to, to, to determine what's going on uh, with uh, the insect. Uh, and as I said, this tends to occur certainly in, in Western New York, late April or early May. Looks like we're going to have kind of an early spring this year. So I'm expecting the first o o OFM moth to, uh, to probably be trapped uh, the, the last week of April, give or take. And you note this biofix date because this is going to be of use to you in a second. But what you want to do is uh, one of the treatment options that's available to you, and I would recommend that you take advantage of it, is uh, pheromone mating disruption especially, particularly if you have a fairly good sized planting. Now we like to see uh, orchards of a, about 10 acres uh, in order for mating disruption to work optimally. Um, many people don't have uh, that large a, a planting, but even, even five acres, uh, it's, it's worth the effort to put out mating disruption uh, because oriental fruit moth is very sensitive to its uh, mating pheromone, its sex pheromone. And uh, it's one of those insects that you can really um, make a, a great uh, uh, improvement to your management program by using um, mating disruption as a component. So uh, it's good to have your, your uh, pheromone uh, products, dispensers out there by the time you get this, th this first uh, flight starting. And we have a number of products available. Uh, there's the isomate uh, ties. Uh, the ones that I would recommend are these twin tube ties. Um, Isomate uh, CM OFM TT twin tube. Uh, Isomate makes an OFM twin tube uh, product, but it's really not uh, available for sale in New York. The, their distribution um, decision was that they were only going to distribute the coddling moth OFM um, combo in New York, but it's actually not a bad idea to, uh, to use this one anyway because coddling moth does also attack. Uh, peaches, and so uh, this is uh, this is a, a way of addressing both pests. Uh, even though cotton moth is fairly a, a minor pest in peaches in New York, but at any rate, uh, the OFM component is makes it worth it anyway. And these go out at 200 per acre. Uh, recently, as as early as uh, last year or a couple of years ago, 
uh, Trace has released a, a, a newer product called Sidetrack, which is a meso, uh, so-called meso dispenser, which means uh, it goes out at much lower densities. Uh, not instead of 200 per acre, you only need between 18 and 36 per acre. And these are somewhat larger. This uh, can't tell from the picture, but it's a it's about a six inch long black strap, as I would say, uh, that you hang in the tree. And it's uh, because it, it goes out at such lower numbers, uh, it's much easier to deploy. Uh, additionally, uh, there is a sprayable option for oriental fruit moth, and we generally don't recommend sprayables uh, for mating disruption, except for this species, oriental fruit moth, just because it is so sensitive and so easy to disrupt. Um, a sprayable formulation, especially if you don't have a particularly rainy period, is obviously very easy uh, to apply, to make, put it into your tank and uh, spray it out as you would any crop protectant. Uh, so this Checkmate Sprayable OFM F is available and it can be used. And then I just would mention because it may be applicable in some cases, if you have a large planting, uh, 15 or 20 acres uh, in minimum, and this doesn't apply to most people, but there could be some uh, operations of this size in the state. Uh, we have these aerosol, so-called puffer uh, type of dispensers. Uh, which go out at one to two per acre. So because they go out at such low densities, uh, we really need uh, a big planting. So we have a checkmate puffer, which looks like a big elongated birdhouse. And uh, there's another product from Isomate called the CMOFM Mist. And these basically are uh, uh, automated dispensers that you, you hang up. Uh, at the beginning of the season and uh, on, based on a timer system and uh, battery powered, they, they will last uh, throughout the, the entire season. So anyway, this is one good component of a, a OFM management program. Um, now, as for, usually you need something in addition to uh, mating disruption for uh, OFM. Uh, a, a good chemical uh, pesticide program is uh, very useful and usually necessary. Um, and so uh, at Petal Fall, you use that biofix date that you, uh, that you were so attentive in, in recording earlier on. And uh, you can, you, using that date, you can calculate uh, when to time your sprays for that first larval generation. Now, unlike in apples, oriental fruit moth develops a little bit quicker and we don't have an, a specific uh, pest prediction model for oriental fruit moth, but we do have a degree day calculator in NUA that you can use to time the sprays. Um, and what you're looking for is uh, something in this area between 170 and 200 degree days, base 45, which is a unique developmental base, but base 45, that many degree days from the biofix, and it generally corresponds to about a 10% uh, hatch of the, of the first generation larvae, because that's the time you want to target for sprays. Um, for first brood, this tends to occur sometime between petal fall and shuck split uh, of peaches. If you haven't used the degree day calculator in NUA, uh, this is what it looks like. You go to the NUA page and under weather data, you go down here, and you'll see a, uh, a, a, an option for degree day calculator. And then you can chip, choose your uh, station, for instance, Voorheesville, um, and be sure you're on base 45 degree days. And uh, the accumulation start date, for that you enter your biofix, okay? So this, this is where you know, the, the system won't um, uh, make an assumption of when biofix is for you, but if you know or if you've got for information for your own planting or for some uh, uh, nearby uh, location, put that in there and then the current date automatically comes in, let's say you're checking on May 10th, and then when you hit the results, it will give you the degree days, accumulated degree days for that station base 45. And this was from 2019. And you can see that on this date last year, we were at 195 accumulated degree days, which is right in the window when you would want to be uh, thinking about putting on that, uh, that petal fall spray, okay? Um, 
control options. We have a lot of good uh, products available that you can use during this timing. Imidan, Asale, Delegate, Altacore, XRL. Uh, somewhat less effective, but still can be used, things like Avana or uh, some pyrethroids, okay? Uh, these uh, products that are uh, starred, once again, do double duty because they're also effective against plum curculio, okay? So you put on a spray at that point um, that the, that the Dubide calculator has, uh, has uh, guided you to, and then a second spray 10 to 14 days later. And then additionally, because OFM can be a very serious pest, uh, pest and a big challenge uh, in many orchards, if you have a high risk block, you can incorporate one other component, which is uh, an insect virus. Um, and there are two products out there that are available, uh, Madex uh, and Virusoft. And these are actually nominally uh, coddling moth viruses. Uh, but the, the current formulations that are out there contain an isolate that is additionally effective against Oreo fruit moth. Okay, and so what you do is uh, you spray these uh, two applications per generation that can go in with your insecticide uh, spray. And uh, over time, they're not like a rescue treatment, but over time they create an epidemic of this virus in the orchard, a very timely uh, kind of thing to be talking about at this point. Uh, and over time, it brings down the population, the whole uh, pressure and um, uh, scale of the of the population in your region in in the area of where you've uh, where you've sprayed and so this is something that uh, we, we especially recommend in apples for coddling moth problems but it's equally uh, applicable against or OFM in peaches uh, in summer for the summer generation uh, use uh, the biofix uh, that you've um, uh, are already established for that f first flight and the new degree day calculated to time the sprays for the second larval generation. Now, if you're, if you're, tr if you're trapping for the beginning of the second flight, which most people don't do because it's kind of difficult, you can use that same number of degree days, 170 to 200 after the start of the second flight. But uh, equally, uh, practical is to use that same uh, first flight biofix and just uh, count up to uh, 1150 to 1200 to get the, the proper uh, window for timing your, your second set of sprays. And it's basically the same treatment options as for the first brood. I would recommend that you rotate uh, your, your insecticide products to uh, use uh, something from a different IRAC group just to avoid uh, possibility of resistance. Um, and then additionally, in high risk blocks, you may uh, keep an eye out for um, continued infestations out there and you might need to apply a final spray two weeks before the harvest against uh, late season larvae that could be still feeding in the, in the uh, fruits. All right, so this is, you know, to be sure, it's a challenging pest to manage, but it can be done, and uh, we, do, we do have some good tools for it. Uh, I would just note that if you are using mating disruption, uh, be aware of the fact that if you have your block that's disrupted uh, and it's near some non-disrupted planting of apples, which obviously also have oriental fruit moth populations, um, mated females from those areas, from those blocks, can migrate uh, as far as uh, oh, a kilometer or two, and they can get into your, uh, into your apples. And varieties that have larger, sorry, they'll get into your peaches. And varieties that have later harvest dates uh, will, will be more susceptible to uh, exposure to infestation. So for instance, if you've got your peaches here that are being disrupted, but right nearby, right next door, say, is a bunch of apples that don't have disruption, you will get movement of uh, mated OFM females, uh, which will get into any of the peaches that you have nearby. Uh, and with the the later harvest, uh, harvested varieties suffering the most damage. And I, I'm taking this directly from some field work that I did uh, some years ago where I got this exact result, this, is, this precise outcome, because I did this without realizing that uh, this was going to be happening. And so despite the fact that mating disruption 
it works quite well against peaches. If you have a, a, a females that are made in someplace else, uh, they can just easily fly in uh, and, and uh, infest your fruits uh, from those areas. Okay, moving on now to tarnished plant bug. Um, it's this, some monitoring is possible. Uh, it's generally not too practical. You can use the white sticky board traps that are available, but uh, these don't work terribly well because they're very nonspecific and you can catch lots of non-target species like flies. And so it can make it difficult to actually make a decision about what you have, what you, what you have flying around in your orchard. Uh, Tarnished plant bug does cause cat facing, but most of that injury is caused before shuck split. Um, and uh, uh, you're going to be basically uh, uh, essentially affecting them uh, as much as you can by what you're using against the other early season pests, um, uh, OFM and plump curculio. Uh, later season feeding generally results only in minor surface scarring, such as I showed you before. Um, so, for threshold, it's just for discussion purposes, but as I said, it's very difficult to, to do in practice. During that pre-bloom to petal fall period, you can look at, at your tree, uh, you look at the developing fruits, and if you find some feeding sites, say three per tree, which would be characterized by um, some damage that has a sap or gum associated with it, or if you are attempting to capture them with the uh, white sticky board traps, uh, this, this threshold of seven adults by the late pink stage has been suggested by people. I frankly have never tried it myself. I know you can catch them, but it, it is kind of a pain uh, to, uh, to try and sort them out from everything else that's flying at that time. Uh, in terms of control tactics, uh, if, you, if you know you have basically a pretty good population of uh, tarnished plant bug in your area, uh, we do have some good materials out there. Belief is one, it's a relatively newer uh, material that's good against tarnished plant bug. Uh, pyrethroids have been sort of a standard fallback material, an option that people use, uh, especially in the summer, July through August as needed. But another uh, thing to keep in mind is that uh, if you reduce the alternate weed uh, pressure in your orchard floor. Uh, these, these serve as sites for uh, the populations of tarnished plant bug to build up. You're going to do a, a, a lot of good in terms of preventing or, or, or suppressing uh, tarnished plant bug uh, infestations. Moving now to peach tree borers. Uh, we have in New York two peach tree borers. One is called uh, the lesser peach tree borer and the other is just called the peach tree borer. Uh, lesser peach tree borer attacks both cherries and peaches. Uh, and uh, these are um, very, well, they, they can be a very a big challenge uh, if, if you've never dealt with them before, but in fact, they're quite manageable. Um, you can, there's good pheromones out there for monitoring for them. Uh, if you want to check when they start to fly, lesser peach tree borer comes out earlier uh, around the beginning of May in Western New York, probably a little bit later in the Champlain Valley. Um, you can also uh, check uh, cankers and injury sites on your scaffold branches for larval infestations. You'll see mixed in with the gomosis of these sites, you'll see some uh, sawdust uh, looking frass that's caused by lesser peach tree borer. Um, it's not really much of a threshold, basically, if you find any, um, and most, most peaches do ultimately get some. Um, so it's a good idea to be proactive against these. Fortunately, we have a very good option uh, for management of uh, peach tree borers. Uh, this is probably the poster child for uh, suitability for using uh, mating disruption in the fruit insect world. Uh, the lesser peach tree borer is so susceptible and sensitive to its sex pheromone that you can basically rely on uh, pheromones uh, to the exclusion of everything else. Okay, we used to have to rely on trunk sprays of insecticides. Uh, it's all, that's always been difficult to do, to implement, and uh, never worked quite as well. Uh, but this product, Isomate PTP, PTB Dual, um, marketed by CBC America uh, is available 
And if you get these, uh, these are twist ties. If you get these ties out there uh, before the first flight, um, which as I said, starts in early May, can, can be uh, uh, up until mid-May at about 150 per acre. Um, you will essentially uh, eliminate um, the, the threat from most of these peach tree borers. Uh, alternatively, there remains uh, uh, materials you can use as trunk sprays, preventive trunk sprays if you so desire. Um, uh, instead, uh, Lors band can still be used. Uh, it can be used once per, per year and uh, that, that's a pretty good um, option. It works very well against peach tree borers. Uh, you know, making applications to the trunk is uh, very, fairly onerous and uh, time consuming. Uh, pyrethroids are also available um, that can be used as trunk sprays. If you're using py pyrethroid, they don't last quite as long as Lorsman, and so you'd have to use basically three sprays in order to do the best job. Uh, one in June, one in July, and one in August, sort of at the, at the beginnings of the month. Uh, the regular peach tree borer looks similar. Uh, these are both clear wing moths. They look sort of like wasps, at their, but they're moths. Um, and uh, as, uh, as our um, lesser peach tree borers, the, uh, the, the females are attracted to uh, areas of uh, injury or, or cankers, like cytosporic canker. Uh, the, the one difference in peach tree borers is that uh, they're fairly, uh, their attacks are confined to low on the tree. Um, basically about the first 10 inches of the trunk above the ground and they actually also uh, can attack the, the, the crown and underneath uh, the soil surface for several inches. Whereas lesser peach tree borer attack all along the trunk and up into the scaffold branches. So if you see things up in the scaffolds, uh, it's probably a lesser. And uh, we don't generally tend to have as large a population of this species. Um, as for lesser peach tree borers, uh, they're, they're more problematic in the in the warmer regions of the state, such as the Hudson Valley. Uh, preventive methods: um, people have used um, a dipping, pre-plant dipping of the roots and crowns in an insecticide solution. Lors band does remain um, uh, labeled for that use. It tends to provide a, a level of protection to the newly uh, set trees for a couple of years. Uh, but once again, this same pheromone product, PTB Dual, uh, also disrupts uh, this species. Uh, and as I say, um, uh, you know, if you get the if you get the dispensers out before the first flight, which for this species is a little later, uh, by late May they'll be starting to fly. Uh, you'll you'll be covering. Uh, basis with this insect, both insects. Alternatively, there are the trunk sprays that are available. And I'm just showing you this little bit of uh, data from a study I did back in 2000. Uh, basically, the pink and the orange uh, lines are undisrupted blocks where we had uh, you know, lots of uh, peach tree borers uh, flying. Uh, and, and lesser peach tree borers. And uh, all of the disrupted blocks were down here. The purple, you can see they're all zero. I didn't catch any, I think one day I caught one moth uh, one, one year uh, in, in these blocks. And so it, this is what you wanna see for mating disruption. It's just complete and total trap shutdown of the insects, just to show you how effective it is. Okay, a word about aphids. Uh, peaches get aphids, they get green peach aphid. Uh, green peach aphid has a winged form and also a wingless form, and they congregate on the leaf uh, terminals, uh, the growing uh, terminals uh, shoots, and uh, they, uh, they can stunt the new growth and cause curling and yellowing. Um, you uh, might want to start monitoring your blossoms, go out and have a look at the trees and see what's going on about the time of blossom and terminals in mid to late May for the colonies. Um, this is sort of a, uh, an academic threshold, maybe a third of the terminals infested means that uh, you need to take some action. Um, as it happens that one of the control tactics is uh, dormant oil application that you may have thought to apply against uh, mites early in the season. Uh, that will also suppress eggs, the overwintered eggs of uh, these aphids. Uh, also, Later in the season, there are some aphicides that uh, work quite well, like Meyer, Atera, Asale, Savanto, Mavento, all of these. 
uh, cherries additionally get aphids. They get black cherry aphid. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are quite distinctive because they are black and so easy to see. Once again, examine the growing terminals uh, pre-bloom and in the summer. Uh, uh, once again, you know, the, uh, the threshold, if you had to say it, uh, uh, several per, per tree, several infested terminals per tree. Uh, control tactics, uh, uh, the, uh, the, some of the um, uh, materials that I've mentioned before, uh, sale, savanto, belief, exorel, or pyrethroid, will control them. Uh, as well as there's a few other uh, more low input alternatives don't work quite as well, uh, but they, they're less, um, uh, the less broad spectrum, such as Grandivo and uh, Azadirect and Azadirect, and even insecticidal soap. Um, it, by the time you get to Shuck Split in early summer, you can add to this list Admire 7 and Movento. All of these are listed also in the Cornell Tree Fruit Guidelines. Uh, cherry fruit flies, in cherries obviously. Uh, in Nor New York we actually have two fruit fly species. One is called the cherry fruit fly, Regulitis faust, uh, singulata, that's the main species. And then there's another one, black cherry fruit fly, our fausta, which is secondary in importance, mostly infest uh, bird cherries or fire cherries. Uh, it can be uh, distinguished by, if you're so dis inclined you can look at the wing and you can see there's a little donut hole uh, pattern in the wing here that you don't see on the regular cherry fruit fly. Um, they're, they both have similar biology, one generation a year. Um, the black cherry fruit fly emerges first um, in, uh, in uh, late May or early June when the early start, tart cherries first start to color. Um, they can start uh, appearing about the time of petal fall, Macintosh, uh, cherry fruit fly about one week later, and they have emergence periods that extend into early July. Uh, you can monitor for them using the yellow sticky boards baited, that have come with a bait, ammonium acetate. Uh, it's best to, uh, if you're going to monitor for them, uh, choose a site that has an abandoned uh, uh, block or abandoned trees to time the adult emergence. Uh, the adults are not mature enough to uh, lay eggs for about a week because they have to feed for about that time and then they'll fly into um, uh, orchards to lay their eggs. Uh, like most maggots, they uh, cut a hole in the root to, uh, with their ovipositor to deposit an egg under the skin and the larvae feed in the pulp and can cause this little separation from the pit and they can cause the uh, pulp to uh, brown. Um, after developing for two to three weeks, the full-grown larva punches a hole through the skin here. You can see one here, and I think one is there, and they drop to the ground pupate. Um, most growers don't feel it's uh, worth the time and effort to actually monitor for them. Basically, they just apply two to three preventive insecticide sprays starting about uh, a week after first emergence in an abandoned site. So it's always good to, uh, if there's somebody in the area who's been monitoring for them and can tell you, okay, cherry fruit flies are out. Uh, sometimes in the newsletters we can uh, tell, uh, publicize that fact. Uh, options include imidan for tart cherries and plus uh, lorsban and some pyrethroids, a few other things, okay. Uh, we'll go next to spotted wing Drosophila, uh, basically mostly in cherry. Uh, as you may know, uh, this attacks many thin-skinned fruits, uh, such as cherry and plum, and also a lot of the berry crops, uh, starting about the time the fruit begins to color, which can be as early as May in New York. It didn't used to be that early, but it's been getting earlier over time. Uh, and they continue their emergence uh, and flight through the harvest period. So the problem with SWD is they have such a short generation time, uh, which can be as little as eight days uh, in, a, in a warm uh, part of the season, that you get multiple overlapping generations uh, at a time within the season. Um, the uh, females have this darkened ovipositor that looks like kind of a sawzall, and they can uh, use that to punch holes in uh, even uh, unripe fruits and uh, insert an egg. Uh, males have the spot on their wings. Uh, as a, they also have, if you're looking that closely, they have some dark uh, bristles on their forelegs. Um, 
They cause damage, of course, but uh, by feeding inside the fruit uh, for up to two weeks uh, for a given insect, they pupate inside and they merge as adults. And uh, the problem is that infested fruits, when they're infested, they can contain numerous maggots, which is not a good sight. Uh, and as there's a mandated zero tolerance for larvae in the cherries. Uh, you can monitor for them uh, using baited traps uh, that indicate when they're building up in a particular area, but uh, it's, it's most practical if you have a lot of traps in a, in a farm to effectively sort of implement a, a threshold. Uh, what's been suggested is 10% of the traps in a given area are catching adults, uh, plus you have presence of susceptible fruit. So traps have come a, a, a long way since we first started, uh, now have commercial lures, attractive lures that are hung in this uh, cup here over a water and borax and soap solution. Uh, alternatively, you can use sticky, sticky uh, yellow cards um, with a uh, yeast solution, also attracts them quite well, but it's quite uh, messy and it's a little more difficult to um, uh, ascertain what you have. Uh, you can look at the harvested fruit using a, a sugar flotation or salt flotation test to detect larvae feeding inside of the fruit. So management is a challenge. It requires a robust management program uh, targeting uh, adults before they can lay their eggs. Um, you need excellent uh, spray coverage of any pesticide you use short intervals, which is difficult to do, five to seven days is recommended, and high volume so that you're, you're covering all of the uh, uh, surfaces of the canopy. Uh, Imidan, pyrethroids, and trust, Exarel are all um, options. Uh, Julie Carroll maintains a good SWD uh, blog network that uh, alerts people to the presence of uh, flies. Uh, trap catches and damage, uh, you might uh, look, watch out for that and uh, log in and become a member of that group. Uh, promptly, promptly harvesting the ripe fruit is a very good preventive me method because uh, uh, that will serve as, a, as an added uh, attractant to the flies. Uh, you can also try to open up the tree canopy by pruning uh, to help uh, mitigate some of the um, congregation uh, of, of the adults and uh, also um, improve the efficiency of your pesticide sprays. Uh, I just threw in this slide on western flower thrips for nectarines. Uh, it's basically a pest that you see. We, we really don't see it very many places in New York except maybe the Hudson Valley. Um, it's worse in seasons with uh, drought conditions and uh, having above average temperatures. Uh, you can take beating samples or you can inspect the, the blooms, uh, etc. But uh, basically, it, it's, it's something that um, if you've had it in the past uh, and you get the right kind of se season, uh, you may want to just be proactive and uh, make a, an application of delegate or entrust before harvest in order to um, uh, manage this pest. Eliminating clover from the row middles is another cultural method that you can uh, implement in order to keep them from building up too much. And then finally, the last pest is Japanese beetle. This is a sporadic pest. Some years are very bad, some years not so bad. Um, the adults come out and feed and they're transient during the summer, but they can do a lot of damage. Uh, it's more severe in sandy locations, especially at the edges of the orchard and near grassy areas. Uh, we recommend uh, insecticide sprays when you see the insects or damage. And there's uh, a few products that are quite good. Seven works well, also a sale and admire may be necessary to apply more than once. Um, there is a milky spore bacteria product that uh, is available, but they, they uh, impact the, uh, the insects in the ground. And so um, they're less uh, less effective just because uh, these insects can migrate in from places where you haven't treated. Uh, you can trap for them. I would not recommend you do this. These bag traps will catch a ton of Japanese beetles. It's, it's not going to do anything to diminish the population and it's only going to make you nervous. So I wouldn't use those. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to make you aware of this publication, uh, Stone Fruit IPM for Beginners. This was produced by the Great Lakes Fruit Workers Group. Uh, it's essentially a series of fact sheets, how to do it uh, for new stone fruit growers and scouts. 
edited by Juliana Wilson at Michigan State. Uh, additional authors and editors included Julie Carroll, Emily Pochebe, myself, and Bill Shane. And this can be, uh, it's, it's available online. Uh, you can download individual chapters or the entire 80 something page booklet as a PDF. It's really good, came out very nice. Um, you'll see it again possibly in this in this uh, webinar, but here's the, uh, the link for where you can download it. Uh, and uh, we will also make it available uh, in, in newsletters to let people know uh, where to get it. Okay, so that is essentially all I have. All right, so now we're gonna switch over to Carrot Cox, who's going to be talking about disease management of stone fruit. Um, he's a professor of plant pathology at Cornell University, and his program focuses on diseases of tree fruits and berries. So I will let you take it away, Carrick. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, let's let's dive right in. I'm gonna go ahead and just start talking about the different stone fruit diseases and the limited and few things that uh, you can do in terms of uh, IPM tactics, as well as a little bit on um, applying materials. So right now, I'll sort of go over all the different uh, seasonal disease risks. As soon as things start breaking bud, your, your first um, group of troublemakers, and, and you can also follow along in the cool scouting calendars that uh, Art mentioned in the IPM Stone Fruit book as well. And a lot of these things will overlap and they'll tell you sort of the same things. Um, the first one you want to look for is leaf curl. I put a picture of it and that picture is not my picture because this disease is so well managed that I've never actually seen it in New York after, I mean, it could be a combination of no one growing stone fruit combined with the, uh, the fact that it is just so well managed by just one or two practices. Now, the other things that can begin to even begin to be trouble at this time are things to look out for and consider include the black knot, bacterial canker and a variety of fungal cankers. I'll show you all the diseases in a little bit, but I just figured we'd go over where the big risks come in. As you begin to move into, we're well, using cherry as, as an example, um, white bud, the first instance of uh, flowers beginning to popcorn or whatnot and start to open. That's when black knot and brown rot really start getting ramped up. And then as you move into bloom and you can start to get leaf tissue, then uh, cherry leaf spot enters the equation as a troublemaker. And at this time as well, in between that period of like the early petal fall and shuck split, that's when you can start to get latent fruit infections, particularly of the brown rot pathogen. And as those move into green fruit um, and maturity, that's when the final stages of brown rot and cherry leaf spot occur. And whether it's cherries, as you can see here, looking incredibly defoliated, that's cherry leaf spot, or even you know other fruit like plum, these things will continue to um, be at risk. And it's not so much once you finish the day and you go away, you might still need to apply one or two applications of a chemical just to keep the overwintering inoculation populations down, um, which can happen in many cases. So it's oftentimes even after the stone fruit are gone that you still need to do things, particularly for bacterial canker, brown, uh, brown rot, and some for cherry leaf spot. So let's talk about some of the pathogens. This is cherry leaf spot, this is blue Mariella japii. It, what it does is it makes these little tiny circular reddish brown spots on the upper surface of leaves. And these leaves here have so many spots that they've already lost all their color chlorophyll and will probably begin to fall off the tree. Um, I'll show you some other pictures later where you can see some earlier symptoms where there's a few spots and the leaves are still green. But for the most part, uh, these are on the verge of being able to defoliate it. Sometimes you can get some shot holing. I can use the old mouse to point and you can begin to see, oh, that little circle is gonna fall right out and they get that ugly chlorosis color and then they will drop prematurely. Um, in theory, if you flip the leaf over and you had some equipment, you could see the echinidia of the fungus underneath the leaves on the spots. And what this will end up doing for the most part is it can, if you don't get good foliage, you're going to get small unevenly ripe fruit. The leaves will defoliate off the tree and they won't overwinter well. You'll get poor vigor, poor bud set for next year and overwintering and the chance of your stone fruit getting uh, hurt by winter injury or just having a poorer year next year because of the buds not overwintering will be, will be greater. And so it's not so much that they get rid of your crop that year, is that they put your tree at risk for some um, severe um, vigor and growing problems. What else do we say about it? 
Uh, most of the uh, IPM type things to do to this one, or here's some, you can see some pictures finally of some young leaves that haven't been completely decimated yet. They will eventually go to yellow. The planning or really do your best to prune to get airflow through the canopy. Don't let your um, your peach, I mean your, your cherry tree just look like a big bush and planted in a hollow where you don't get no wind. Um, you can do a lot for this disease just by getting good flow through the canopy. And then the only other thing that's really recommended across all sources is you start your management program as soon as the leaves emerge. And this can go on for quite some time because the leaves don't fall off the tree until the fall. For the most part, your brown rot fungicide program will, uh, will do the job for you. And um, there's a lot of resistance in Michigan, but we grow so few cherries in New York, I would suspect that our local populations might still be affected by many things. If you're in a really heavy producing area and you've got cherry leaf spot from year to year to year and you keep putting on your materials, then uh, you could have some. But for the most part, a lot of the things that we would talk about or use would, be, would still be effective if you were to start a new planting. Um, a lot of things that they mentioned too is the post-harvest fungicide. And you know, this, this disease is just gonna keep going even after you pick all the fruit off the tree and then they'll prematurely defoliate. So it's kind of a frustrating thing. You think, oh, I'm finished with the fruit, I can walk away. Nope, um, if you get the early defoliation, the trees will be very sad and, and uh, they won't overwinter well. You might not get good bud set for next year and they'll just keep, um, this the fungus will just keep running them into the ground year to year to year and you won't get a good crop the next year. So. The post-harvest fungicide application can some instances be just as important as the ones during the season. So even though you think, oh, the fruit are gone, don't give up on cherry leaf spot. It can be a troublemaker the entire season. Um, one of the other ones that can sometimes show up, I often see this in ornamental plantings and areas that are just completely unmanaged, is the black knot, Apiosporina morbosa. And it makes something that looks kind of like a thick, hard gall over the, uh, the shoots of the trees. It's really a fungal stroma and it's just filled with tons and tons of spore bearing structures. It's very hard. Um, you could hurt someone with it if you hit them with one of these things. So they're not soft squishy, but this is a really nasty uh, bit of spermatic tissue that's very tough and very woody. And it will form itself inside the branches. You can imagine that these particular shoots aren't in good form. Um, the infections actually happen around bud burst. Once you start to get those buds popping open and you can start to begin to see the first bits of light, but they won't actually mature and make spore. So if you see one of these in your tree, that means your management has failed probably about two seasons ago. And if you think, well, I cut all of these out, you'll need to keep cutting because once you've seen this, this is an infections that have occurred for about two seasons. What this will end up doing, it will cause a lot of loss of bearing wood. You'll have to cut all these things out of the tree. Otherwise, it'll just continue to snowball until the entire tree is just a bunch of knots. And they'll arrest growth of the tree, reduce productivity. Um, a, real, a real problem uh, fungus, if you will. What do you do to manage this one? Well, the first thing to do is inspect all of your planting material. And if you see any galls, and at first they'll be kind of a bronze, they'll look like the bark of the, uh, of the, of the, of the tree itself. It'll get all the stone fruit. It won't just get cherries, but I often see it in ornamental cherries, but I've seen it peach, plum. It seems to be, a, you can see there's a picture here on plum. Here's a planting there, and you can just see all the little tiny galls. So when you get new planting material, look for any abnormal swellings on any of the material that you get. When it first leaves out, look for any, um, it'll have the same bronzes color as the bark itself on the trees. Look for anything that looks swollen and remove it. And the idea is that you prune all the branches with the knots and take them off site. Burning is always best, but you know, you can't always burn things. There is a two season lag. So if you're cutting this off or you're cutting all these things off and you can see here, it's almost too much. There's so many knots all over all of these trees. The best thing to do would be to use the front end loader and replant next year because you're never going to get it all. Oh, there's so many little ones. And then there's a two year lag and you'll just feel like you're never, you're never able to keep up with it. And it's so labor intensive. Um, if you don't have this situation, I wouldn't even recommend fungicides at this point. I would say time to get rid of them and start over. Then if you're on point with a good program and you know, a lot of these things that you use for brown rot and other diseases will manage this one as well. Start at a fungicide at bud burst, green tip, 
and it's most susceptible from that white bud stage. We'll sort of like slowly go back. You don't need to see this. You know, right there, white bud stage, right there to shuck split. So this is where some of the real magic is going to happen for that black knot. So we'll go back again. Yeah. And then uh, chlorothalonil, um, it's a fungicide that we can use in stone fruit, but we're not allowed to use in apples. Uh, highly effective on this, but the problem is, is that after Shuck splits over with, no more chlorothalonil. The DMI fungicides are also um, particularly uh, effective. Things like Endar would be one of the ones that comes to mind for stone fruit. Inspire Super, I believe, is also labeled for stone fruit as well. These would be really good to put one of those in at that time, even though you might want to save them for your cover sprays later on. What else? Bacterial spot of stone fruit. Um, yep, this is a fun one, Xanthomonas arboricola, Pathobar pruni. This is a, a frustrating disease to manage. Here it is on a, looks like a nectarine, probably a white flesh nectarine. It will cause shot holing in the leaves, which means it's now compromising the leaves, which will compromise your ability to produce fruit. And on the fruit, it produced these nasty, pitted, hard, sunken spots. They're very um, corky, if you will. And, and sometimes you can see ooze. I've, I rarely to never see it. And if the infection gets really severe, this is like the, the worst kind of cherry leaf spot. Because in this case, this bacterium will defoliate the entire tree and ruin the crop. All these spotted fruit are completely unmarketable. Yeah, it's really sad in that particular case. What this is really a problem with is it doesn't often show up in the uh, stone fruit, white flesh nectarines and apricots and things that we breed here on the Eastern United States. They're well, um, they would be selected out for this disease, but it's very devastating to the really hot, desirable California and other varieties that are grown in the desert. Um, in that particular case, you know, they would never have been seen for any susceptibility to this disease. It's endemic to the Eastern United States because we have wet weather and um, all it takes is little bits of damage and the bacteria will come in. So they'll bring in these fancy, really neat and exotic cultivars and white flesh nectarines, plums and peaches, and they just will get decimated. Here's some pictures of uh, apricots. You can see the spots are a little bit different on the leaves. They may not be shot holing, but on the fruit, they can almost begin to look like a snake's egg with the sheer number of heavy cratering and stuff like that. But a lot of the breeding program here would have been like, oh yeah, well, we're not going to put this forward. That will get removed. But it's usually in the other varieties that you think, oh, I really like to have this particular material. It sells for a ton of money, fresh market, and it just will just get decimated by these types of things. And they're all highly susceptible. What do you do? Um, I wouldn't, this is not a thing to plant if you're on Long Island. A lot of the Long Island areas are very sandy. This is incredible. You just have to avoid sandy sites. And for most of us, this might be okay in Western New York. The sand will pick up with our natural um, rainforest-like rain events, and the sand will get blown. It'll damage the fruit. The bacteria will come right in, and they'll make those gross-looking um, injuries. Um, what you can do is one of the few materials that's labeled as oxytetracycline, that shuck split period where the uh, where the sepals fall off and the, pet and the petals fall off and revealing the little bit of a green fruit, um, that part is the most susceptible uh, to infection. And the other thing you can do is frequent low rates of copper with hydrated lime. Um, there's a couple other materials, but the real, the real clincher of it is, is that nothing is really registered for this disease. There's only a couple formulations, uh, oxytetracycline or a few coppers. The reason you don't want, a lot of coppers aren't registered and that one's difficult, because the copper injury often mimics the exact same symptoms on the leaves as the bacterial pathogen. So a lot of um, no materials are registered, particularly coppers, because you know the companies don't want to get slapped with injury lawsuits. So it's something that can really injure fruit at the time, but it's um, a good bit of research out of North Carolina has made some suggestions, but the problem is, is there's nothing registered. And if you're not peaches, well, really nothing is registered for the disease. Um, you can look for the peach label. You'll go look to see if your apricots are on it. Mm, they, they won't be there. It's a very frustrating situation to manage in this case. It's almost better to avoid the uh, susceptible cultivars and get things that were maybe bred here and avoid all the white flesh nectarines really get it and the apricots really get it. Well, with that bit of depressing news, um, let's go to fungal cankers. 
let's look at a uh, couple different ones. Leukostoma is a really big one. Um, Botrysferia are some problems here. They will look like a lot of different cankers here. The bark can crack. They can make little fruiting bodies inside things. Gamosis will be going quite nasty and oozy. A lot of times, any place that less likely to harden off right before winter injury, we'll get a little bit of winter injury and these fungi will come out in the early part of the spring and get them. You can see here, there's an ugly canker right there at, um, at crotch angles. The ooze itself is just a wound response. Don't think of this like fire blight and think, oh my God, look at all the fungi. Nope, that's just the uh, sap of the, um, of the particular um, uh, tree. They'll infect wounds, usually at the site of winter injury, physical injury, deer come rubbing on it, anything that happens. You get a herbicide out there and a little bit gets aerosol. All it has to do is just kill the bark just enough to allow these fungi to get in there and they'll make incredibly devastating cankers. Can't quite beat them. You lose the bearing wood, the, the trees look awful. These can kill large scaffolds and limbs. Sometimes you can begin to see some of the little instances of some of the fungal um, structures there on this particular one. And here's another one right there that's just been uh, wiped out on some peaches. They can cause severe girdling and you can get a tree killed with this if you're unable to manage them. Eh, what do you do? Um, right now a lot of the sources will recommend prune out the infective cankers and remove, take them off site. It's always, uh, they often in this particular case is the stone fruit guide in a couple of other places recommended doing it after petal fall. So you get the best amount of healing and always do it on cool, dry weather. Pretend like, think, what weather would I do stuff in if I was, what weather would the uh, West Coast use when they grow these stone fruit in the desert? And don't worry about that. You look at their weather and it looks, oh, wow, it's a cool, dry day. That's the time to do it. Anytime you get one of those, you might not get one. And then that's when those, these cankers devastate the entire planting. Um, but you look for a cool, dry weather. If you prune on warm, wet weather, you're just making a new wound for the disease to cause infection. Uh, get it out and do the best you can. A um, couple other things said, avoid late season nitrogen. Any succulent tissue will may not harden off well before winter, causing a winter injury. And then the next year, you'll end up getting an infection on that injured tissue. And then again, training trees to avoid these narrow crotch angles. There's always, there's other, the weakest part and the last part to harden off is a crotch angle for winter. And that could just be a source of injury. So try not to get such a narrow angle where you would accumulate a lot of water, fungus, and injury. Um, that's another rather depressing and difficult thing to manage. And it's one of those ones where you, there's no silver bullet spray to get rid of uh, various fungal cankers. Let's move away from that one and talk about another bacterium that's completely awful. Um, bacterial canker, as if fungal cankers aren't enough. Um, bacterial canker is a problem. You can see here, this is a site I visited um, way back in the day with a loft team. And you can see there is a black canker at almost every, um, just above the, 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 the graft union and almost every cherry tree in this planting. It's awful. It's caused by two different bacteria, Pseudomonas syringae, Pathovar syringae, and the same one, Pathomar morris pernorum. And here it is. Um, uh, on this another cherry tree, you can see that this whole shoot is flagged. It looks all wet and it's not necessarily because it rained. It's just sort of souping um, sort of an oozier, more liquid bacteria. You know, it's not like large chunks of gamosis. It looks just sort of wet and shiny. And right there is the infamous pruning wound that often leads to problems. Um, for the most part, the, the symptoms are soft, sunken, oozing cankers at cr crotch angles and branch points and pruning cuts. Uh, anytime you can get any part that's easily injured, um, you can find one of these cankers. One of the things that often happens in Michigan is they get a, the, they get a little spring freeze and it stays wet. And in a lot of cases in their orchards, the, the bacteria is endemic and a constant problem. If you get one of these spring freezes that quickly thaws and goes to warm weather rather quickly, the, uh, the, um, the entire, oh, um, all the blossoms will blight with, this, with these various pseudomonas. And I don't have any pictures of it because I haven't experienced it, but for the most part, you can actually get all your spurs blighted with this as well. If there's like a quick spring freeze, it turns wet and the bacterium goes in and just starts killing everything in sight. Uh, it infects wounds in cool, wet weather. That's why even though you're like, oh, it just had a freeze that killed some blossoms, eh, you can just get right in those when it warms back up to 45 and kill everything. 
what do you do? Um, you lose all your bearing wood, you can lose productivity, you can lose the entire tree. Um, you can get severe girdling and tree decline. And you can see here, here's a nice pruning one here. It's sort of this little sunken area is just sort of the margin of the advancing bacterium and how far it can actually go. You can cut it and see like, well, there's healthy, there's dead. Um, you can lose the entire tree and then try our orchards to this stuff. Anything you can do to avoid winter injury or chemical, physical, frost injury, these types of things are how to get rid of bacterial canker. The other thing to do as well is that cool, dry pruning is important and leaving a good six inch pruning stub. Um, that's not a six inch pruning stub, as you can see right there. And what do you know, what do we have? Um, it looks like in this case, it sort of arrested it, but you might not get that lucky. It might just keep going all the way to the main tree and wipe things out. Finally, the best thing to do also is to apply copper at 20 and 80% leaf drop. What ends up happening is in the fall, the leaves will start to fall off the tree. And you might as well just assume that the bacteria is constantly present. So let's say there's some rain, the leaves fall off, that abscission will create negative pressure and will suck the uh, bacteria right into the tissue, into that, um, into that leaf drop defoliation scar. And if you can keep copper on those scars, the bacteria won't be able to multiply and do a good job of getting in at leaf drop. And so uh, Julie Carroll's done an incredible amount of work on this. And it looks like the consensus is 20 and 80% leaf drop if you have this. If the whole orchard starts to go, I think it's time for the front end loader and to start over. The good news is, is it seems to really only get cherries, but then again, the peaches get the fungal cankers. And so there seems to be no winning um, with diseases sad as it is to say. And finally, we'll sort of tap off with the, the big the big one, brown rot. It's a problem all over worldwide, anywhere, prunus and even malice and even pyrus are grown. You can see brown rot on apples. It's really on cherries. It's the things that are most susceptible are the things without any fuzz or wax and have the most sugar. Highest would be um, apricot, nectarine, sweet cherry. They don't have any, they're all about the same. And then peach is one of the lower ones, even though you'll get tons of it, just because of the trichomes all over the surface of the fruit. It's a problem in organic apple, and you can find it anytime that modern fungicides aren't um, used for management. Um, we have a couple of different species here. We got Monolenia fructicola, it's a species native to North America. It's invasive to Europe and Asia. It's an aggressive fruit rot pathogen and Europe is very scared of it, and it will rot everything in sight. The second one we have is Monolenia laxa, which is a species native to Europe. It's often called European brown rot. It really likes cold, wet weather, and it will blight um, shoot tissues and flowers readily. It's less of, it's the fruit, uh, the other one outcompetes this one on the fruit, but for the most part, this will take out shoots. There it is, it's aggressive shoot and blossom pathogen, and this is in New York. Me, this is an apricot tree that all the shoots are just sporulating with monolenia laxa. It was super gross on a really wet year. And yep, a couple of different phases. It can cause a blossom blight. Both can. Monolenia laxa is the bigger one. And it's when you have cold, wet weather bloom for a long period of time. And while the bacterial canker is blighting spurs, the monolenia will also come in and blight it. You can see it's brownish canidia brownish gray canidia there, and they will just continue to blight. Look, there is a, a peach fruit right there. This is the shuck split. Petals are falling off. The sepals are gone. The um, immature fruit is incredibly susceptible. And it also happens when you use protectants of bloom, like chlorothalonil. It doesn't really work well on monolenia laxa, and you really need to use the harder fungicides that you might be wanting to save for summer coverage. And let's see, there's more shoot blight on laxa. You can kill entire shoots. As I've shown, you can see it's sporulating there. It's all over the fruit. It's right in the spurs. It just gets in the wood and just starts killing things if we get a long, cold, wet weather bloom. Um, yep, and I'm shown before it can kill the entire tree. Here's a sporulating little spur right there that was wiped out by laxa and those ornamental cherries from Rhode Island. It doesn't always have to go on production trees. It will get your ornamental plantings too. If we have a really cold, wet spring, uh, this can occur. What else do you want to say? Oh yeah, this the cycle of round rot never ends. Green fruit rot. Um, this is, looks must be a, I'm guessing this is a cherry. And right here you can get these latent infections. They get infected by brown rot, maybe from that. And um, they still there. All these papery remnants of settles, sepals and petals split and reveal the fruit. And you can just, they can just get colonized with brown rot and bam. 
and you can get latent infection usually prior to pit hardening in the various stone fruit. They get infected there and they're just gonna wait until a bunch of sugar and a bunch of water is ready and they're gonna rot your fruit from the inside out. So even as you're spraying all the outsides of the fruit during your cover sprays, these will just be rotting on the inside. And that's why it gets really incredibly um, important to that shuck split phase right before pit hardening when everything is super susceptible to make sure you've got your best management game going. All right, and then of course as the weather warms. Um, they get a lot of sugar, the fruit swell, and they will just begin to infect. They'll infect each other anywhere they touch. So any amount of cluster thinning you can do is going to be awesome. Um, and then post-harvest, these things, even if you pick them and put them away, they'll just start sporulating from all the latent infections or infections where this one got touched or a little spore landed over there. Give it a couple of days in the refrigerator and you'll have brown rot fruit in no time. And then of course, finally, the nasty thing about these is they overwinter on these mummies. All the water gets sucked out of the fruit, making a sporulating bit of plant and fungal tissue that falls on the ground and will stay in your branches and survive next year and make more canidia to start the whole thing off in the early spring. And that's how it continually begins. It's endemic. You, it's everywhere stone fruit are grown. There's no avoiding it, unfortunately. You can already begin to see that this one is starting to get infected right there. It's particularly gross. And then these things will, uh, sometimes they'll fall on the ground. There's the grayish canidial sporulation. It can be on blossom fruit and shoots. And sometimes a little mushroom will form on mummies. Um, this is a mummy on the ground. It has to have some sort of flesh with it. And we don't often see them. I've never observed one on the Eastern United States. I've observed uh, other types of brown rot making them, but they're not on stone fruit. So it looks like in this case, it's primarily due to overwintering of canidia, either on the mummies on the trees, in different cankers, or other parts on the tree. And so this is typically when this would go. Brown rot first becomes a problem from the fruit mummies right at the white bud burst, and then blossom blight can happen there as these things continually to sporulate and infect. And then of course you can get some shoot cankers, you get all the latent infections happening right around there, and then you get some maturity. And uh, with that, I think my time is up and I will go ahead and uh, um, take any questions. Thanks again, Carrick, and we'll go ahead and start loading up Lynn's talk. All right, so we're going to just kind of uh, fly through weed control in peach and cherry orchard systems. So weeds and orchards, this is the ob obligatory slide as to why weeds are important. First and foremost, weeds are the direct competitors for our crops for water, light, and nutrients. And it's particularly gonna be for water uh, in, in early orchard systems. Uh, weeds, when they get large, can impact the deposition of crop protection chemicals. Uh, so for the, the treatment of pathogens and insects, they provide habitat for invertebrate and vertebrate pests. Art talked about this. They can alter crop microclimates and that's going to influence disease development. It's going to interfere with harvest operations potentially. And if you get something like poison ivy uh, getting on trees, it can provide potential injury to the workers directly. So this was some work that was done in 1985 and this was looking at Bermuda grass interference in newly planted peach trees. And, and basically it just shows that the more cover uh, you have of, of, of weeds, uh, the, the more reductions in tree growth that you're going to see. So this is really crucial uh, for keeping weeds out of orchards, uh, particularly when they're young, uh, you know, starting clean and, and staying clean. This is just some, some more information, just basically kind of that say the, the exact same thing. Uh, the critical period for getting those young fruit trees established is gonna be May to July when you're thinking about maximizing trunk diameter growth. Um, the critical weed-free period for bearing trees is gonna be bud break to 30 days after bloom if you wanna maintain yields. That came out of Ontario. Andrew McCray out of NC State University uh, found that the critical weed-free period was or bloom to 12 weeks after bloom for maximizing peat fruit size and number. 
And really, uh, Mitchum and Lockwood, they're again out of NC State, that first three years after peach planting is really gonna be necessary to maximize uh, tree growth. Uh, this is just uh, basically some of the same information for, for tart cherries that was done. Early season weed control gives you more nodes, longer inner nodes, greater leaf area, greater trunk circumference. But late season weed control is going to be important for yields. And, and again, that's going to sort of harken back to the, the previous slide where, you know, if you want to maximize your fruit yield, it's going to be around that flowering period, uh, but for maximizing the growth in, in the young trees, it's, it's going to be that early season um, competition. So if we look at weed management strategies in orchards, first and foremost, if you're getting ready to put an orchard in, it doesn't matter what orchard site selection. Understanding if you've got difficult to control weed species, such as perennial weeds that are present, because those weeds are gonna cause problems for multiple years to come. Uh, this is a walnut orchard where I was working in California. This is field bindweed, Convolvulus arvensis. We have a lot of field bindweed in annual production systems. And when we transition those to the higher value uh, tree and vine systems, we find that we start to have field bindweed problems in, in those production environments too. So you really have to be focused on managing those perennial weed species, you know, even before you've got the orchard in the ground. That's gonna be things like field bindweed, hedge bindweed, Canada thistle, yellow nut sedge, Johnson grass, curly dock, goldenrod. So either avoid sites that can't be managed or else aggressively suppress the weeds, whether it's physically or chemically to get yourself a good start. So if we're gonna talk about physical disturbance for a perennial weed control, basically you have to continuously deplete those underground nutrient reserves that are supporting that above ground growth and development. And for a lot of species, they found that this requires cultivation about every seven to 14 days in a fallow system. Uh, in addition to depleting those underground nutrient reserves, it could desiccate potentially regenerative fragments, which can help prevent regrowth and reestablishment. Now, this kind of intense soil disturbance is gonna be problematic with respect to soil structure, soil health, and the potential for erosion. So I'm not gonna minimize it, but I'm just gonna say, you know, this is kind of historically what we have found with a lot of perennial species that we need to do. This is some work that was done with field bindweed in the 1940s. And, and just to show you kind of like the intensity that is needed. Now, they were cultivating every two to three weeks and they basically found that they had to cultivate for two to two and a half fallow seasons to be able to eradicate those vines. And if you look to the right, this is field bindweed. It's got root systems that can go down to about depths of about 30 feet. So that's why this kind of intense management was really necessary. So just, just be aware of the biology and the ecology of these species and what it might take if you're gonna physically uh, be disrupting them in your systems. It's important to understand that infrequent cultivation, if this is the strategy you're looking at, can actually make the problem worse. Um, while cultivation can exhaust uh, energy uh, and it can expose those underground structures to desiccation, infrequent cultivation just can move those root rhizome fragments, bulbs around the field and can allow them to become reestablished. And, and this is actually some field bindweed uh, in California that uh, a farmer was dragging around on, on, on the back of his tractor moving it around the field. So we often use systemic herbicides to go in and manage perennial weeds. Uh, a lot of that is glyphosate, WSSA9. If you're using broadleaf weeds, we might be using the auxinic herbicides, WSSA4. And their systemic herbicides are really effective tools because they can be translocated throughout the target plants and kill more tissue than what was just treated. So if you were going in with something like a, a contact herbicide like Paraquat, you're just gonna burn off any tissue the herb that Paraquat comes into contact with. Um, products like glufosinate or the grass herbicides, the ACCase inhibitors with respect to grasses, they actually move through the plant and they are going to be able to affect control at distant tissues. But single applications are not going to be effective. 
But it's also important to understand that the timing of applications is gonna be really crucial uh, to maximize the capture of the herbicide and to make sure it's properly moving systemically in the plant. Uh, this is some work that was done in the 1970s and 80s, and they, this was done with field bindweed. And basically what they found is that field bindweed control with Roundup uh, was improved uh, between May and August when it was applied in the summer when the plants were flowering, as opposed when they made early spring applications or they started getting into fall when the plants were more vegetative. And I just want you to be thinking about kind of the biology, the ecology, and the nature of perennials and why you might not see equal control with these species all year round. So this is just a theoretical bindweed curve um, for, um, you know, a theoretical control curve for field bindweed. Um, emerging shoots, when, 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 when these perennials are just getting out of the ground, you are just not going to have enough biomass to capture enough herbicide to, to control these really extensive root systems. Also, when you have these shoots emerging, what you have is you have flow of movement away from the roots. And with a, a, a weed like field bindweed, you want to move glyphosate to the roots, and it's a phloem translocated herbicide. So if everything's moving away from the roots, you're not getting it to go where it needs to go. In the fall, these plants are going to be senescing. Uh, you're going to have pest infestations that might reduce their biomass and vigor and, and could reduce the amount of, of um, area you know, to capture the herbicides, as well as bud dormancy, limiting translocation to active meristems. So I'm not sure that we always have a very good handle on when is it too late to make a systemic application to uh, you know, a perennial weed. You know, there is gonna be a cutoff point and that's work that I'm hoping to do while I'm, I'm here in New York. But just understand is that not all timings are gonna be equally effective. And we really want when these plants are vigorously growing, if we're gonna go in and treat with systemic herbicides. So some other strategies that are non-chemical related for management in orchards, uh, cultivation, uh, shallow cultivation, one to two inches, four to six times per season can be effective against young annual weeds. Used aggressively though, it can damage trees and facilitate soil erosion and organic matter loss. Mulching, we found mulch can provide physical suppression of germination and emergence of weeds. It's costly and difficult to source. It can provide a habitat for vertebrate pests and it can interfere with subsequent weed control efforts. So you really want to be aware of, you know, takeaways, you know, and trade-offs with strategies that you're going to use for weed management. Uh, if anyone's doing flame weeding, it can be used to manage annual species, but broad leaves are going to be better controlled than grasses, and that's going to be due to the position of the meristem. The meristem on grasses is going to be below the ground for a lot of the growing season, and it's going to be protected. Uh, from damage. That's why uh, contact herbicides might also not be very effective. It doesn't burn the plants. That's a, what, if you're, what you're thinking is you're going to burn the plants down. Technically not. What it does do with flame weeding is it causes cells to vaporize and cells to burst. Just like a chemical sprayer though, a, a flame weeder operation, a unit, is going to have to be calibrated. Um, it's also, you're going to have to monitor your ground speed just like a chemical sprayer. You know, it's, it's, it's not just going out there and, and, and burning willy-nilly. And there's also fire concerns if you've got dried uh, plant material or, or vegetation. Uh, we tried using this when I was in California and we basically just had, a, you know, some students were out trying flame weeding and the, the teacher going behind them and basically stomping out fires, you know, because California is so dry. So understand that that's, a, that's definitely a concern. Permanent sod is with a, a weed-free strip under the trees is probably really frankly for a great amount of the area, you know, our most common management strategy for the orchard floor. Reduces erosion, it provides support for heavy equipment, reduces dust, insulates against cold penetration, again, for in addition to other benefits. Weeds should be managed as well as possible before planting, especially perennials, as kind of a throwback to our, our previous slides. Um, mode for management of permanent sods, 
uh, but slow growing and dwarf species can reduce the number of passes required, but also understand that mowing, if, if perennials do get established, um, it might not effectively manage them because they have that nutrient reserves to regrow. Uh, the same with prostrate or spreading weeds. They may just be under the mower deck and you're going to find it, find it hard to, to keep those plants from spreading into the tree row. Now, herbicides. And we're probably going to focus a lot on herbicides because frankly in the United States we use a lot of herbicides for weed management. Uh, and, and, and not surprisingly, because you know, these are really optimized tools uh, for us to, to you know, um, take advantage of. Uh, herbicides, in fact, really, when we look across um, all of our pesticide classes, uh, this was an, an older slide, but I, I don't think the data has changed too much, are really one of the top products that we use uh, across all cropping systems in, in the agronomic sector. Um, this was 2012 data, and we found that we're putting about uh, 0.6 billion pounds of active ingredient of herbicides in the United States, and that's costing uh, user groups about $6.2 billion. Uh, so we're using a lot of herbicides, so we need to understand the herbicides and use them well. With respect to the herbicides that we've got, they can be broken up and looked at in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, there's the growth inhibiting herbicides. Uh, so this is going to uh, cover a, a couple of groups. So this is going to be our, our WSSA1. These are going to be our ACCase inhibitors, our grass inhibitors like Cethoxidem, which is a post-emergence product. WSSA2, uh, which is Remsulfuron, which we can use pre or has a little bit of early post-activity. Our um, WSSA3, these are going to be our yellow herbicides, our dinitroanilins which are soil applied products. WSSA4, these are our synthetic auxins. Uh, nine, this is glyphosate, it's a post-emergence herbicide. It is the only herbicide in this group. And then WSSA20 and nine. So this is gonna be products like diclobinil uh, and indaciflam. We also have herbicides where we talked about herbicides that are gonna slow down or interfere with crop growth. We have herbicides that are out there that just destroy tissues. That's gonna be WSSA5 and 7, which are our photosystem 2 inhibitors, gonna be Diuron, Simacine, Turbacil. Uh, WSSA10, which is gonna be glufosinate. WSSA12, which is Solicam, Norflorazon. Uh, the 14s are gonna be our PPO inhibitors. Products like Carfentrazone and Paraflufen, which is gonna be AIM and Venue, are post-emergence applied, whereas products like Flumioxazin and Oxiflorophen are gonna be primarily pre, but have some early post-activity. And then WSSA22, which is gonna be um, Paraquat and a Photosystem One electron diverter. We can also talk about our herbicides in addition to how they control weeds, is to when they're applied and to what they are applied to. So we're gonna break it out now, and we're just gonna cover this kind of quickly, the pre-emergence herbicides. So these are gonna be herbicides that are gonna be applied to the soil. So the first one is gonna be our ALS inhibitors. This is gonna be rim sulfuron, which is gonna be matrix. It's mostly broad spectrum. This is a pre-emergence herbicide with early post activity, so it could get very small seedlings, but really consider a tank mix partner. It's got a short residual time in the soil, so it needs sequential applications or a tank mix partner if you're gonna expect season long residual control and there's tree age restrictions. Our yellow herbicides, the microtubule inhibitors are in WSSA3. These are grass herbicides. They have no post activity uh, with the exception of curb. Uh, so foliar treatments are gonna be needed uh, for the management of any kind of standing vegetation. Uh, these products are Arizolan, which is surfland, uh, which can be used in newly planted orchards once soil is settled. Uh, it can get some small seeded broadleaves like pigweeds, but again, better on grasses. Prowl H2O, again, mostly grass control, but can get some lamb's quarters and pigweeds. If you're using Prowl 3.3 C, this is a non-bearing herbicide only. Pronamide or CURB is a restricted use pesticide. It's got pre and early post activity, tree age restrictions. It's gotta be used in fall before free up, but when temperatures don't exceed 55 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and it's got limited activity on uh, annual broadleaves. Again, WSSA3 are grass herbicides primarily. WSSA5 and 7, these are photosystem 2 inhibitors. These tend to be better on annuals, on uh, broadleaves, unlike the, the previous class, which is better on grasses. Uh, so they're going to need partners to improve grass control. Uh, Diuron is going to be on peaches only. Uh, some formulations can be restricted use, and there's tree age restrictions associated with these herbicides. Uh, simazine is a restricted use herbicide. It can't be used in Long Island. Tree age restrictions, and understand on low pH soils, it's going to have uh, reduced activity. So it's not going to control weeds as well as it might on a neutral or higher pH. WSSA12 is a carotenoid biosynthesis inhibitor. This is actually gonna provide season long control of annual grasses and it's also gonna provide some perennial grass suppression. This is Solicam, Norflorazon. It's not for use in Long Island. There are tree age restrictions associated with it. It can control many broadleaf weeds, but tank mix partners are probably gonna be required with this plant depending on your weed spectrum. The WSSA 14 herbicides are gonna be our PPO inhibitors. Uh, these tend to be better on broad leaves, although some can be broad spectrum depending on the active ingredient. Uh, the first is going to be flumioxacin, which is Chateau herbicide. Uh, its use is going to vary with tree age and protection, whether you're, you're protecting uh, young stems with non-porous tree wraps. Uh, early, it's a pre-emergence herbicide. It can have some early post, but it needs a tank mix partner. Uh, but in, in light of that, it can also enhance the activity of some post-emergence herbicides that it's applied with. Oxiflorophan uh, is for dormant applications only before bud swell or after harvest due to volatility injury concerns. This also can have some post-activity, but it's going to need a tank mix partner for grasses. Uh, our last group of pre-emergent herbicides is going to be our WSSA 20 and 29 group. These are cell wall biosynthesis inhibitors. Um, they can provide broad spectrum control and caseron. Diclobanil actually has some perennial weed suppression. So diclobanil pre and does have some early post activity, cherries only. Uh, November 15th to February 15th applications because of volatility losses, there are tree age restrictions. Uh, and and uh, this is a translocated herbicide, so it can move through the roots. In Dazaflam, Allion uh, is uh, group 29. This is a restricted use pesticide, not for use on Long Island, tree age restrictions. There's also water protection restrictions if, if you're looking, and all of this information can be found in the pest management guidebook. There are water protection restrictions. Unlike uh, Caseron, this is not gonna control. Uh, emerged weeds. So, you know, you're going to have to actually manage the vegetation in advance of this going down because this really has to be applied uh, to a clean soil surface uh, to get good uh, soil herbicide contact and improve efficacy. So, this is just some general notes about the pre emergence herbicides in general. Uh, and, and, and this is going to go back to what we just said about Allion. First and foremost, soil contact. We're, we're using most of these as residual products. These are soil applied products. And in that case, soil contact for a lot of them uh, is going to be critical. So you have to be very mindful of leaf litter or trash or, or standing vegetation or other interference that is going to, to impact the deposition of these products. And some products like Allion, like Matrix, are gonna be probably more sensitive than a product like Keseron might be. The stability of these herbicides is gonna differ. Um, some of them are gonna to have to be activated much more quickly than others. And if you look at the labels, you're gonna see activate within 24 hours, within 48 hours, within you know, two weeks, whereas something might be more three weeks where it can sit on the soil surface. So, Understanding the stability of these products differs, that's gonna influence their activation requirements and, and the time that you know, can pass before or incorporation is gonna require, uh, and then you lose residual activity. 
Trees differ in their solubility and their adsorption potential to the soil. So that's going to affect leaching potential, but it's also going to affect how long these residues can remain in the soil and do their job. So something like matrix has a very short residual time, maybe 60 days, maybe 90 days, very short lived, very short residual time. Rates are going to differ in response to soil type and weed identity. So you have to pay attention to that. And that's also why you need to know what weeds you're dealing with. It also can affect residual control longevity. Again, some of these products have um, early post activity as well. I'm not sure I would rely on them alone for early post, you know, weed control. They're probably, they're going to need tank mix partners. See labels about those tank mix partners so you can expand that spectrum of control, whether it's from the residual activity or to burn down standing vegetation. And obviously pay attention to tree age restrictions, the seasonality of applications, and understand that spray contact, even if these are residual products, can cause injury to the trees themselves. Uh, the next slide I want to show you is just uh, uh, the injury. Like we often think about drift injury, we often think about contact injury, we often think about use injury coming from contact herbicides, from foliar herbicides. This is actually Allion injury on young grapes. Uh, Allion has a pretty strict label for use in grape systems, and this was done in California. This is a pretty young raisin orchard. They went and put Allion out. It's also a sandy soil. So, so just be aware, we can see this injury uh, from pre-emergence herbicides. With respect to our post-emergence products, uh, our WSSA1s, these are going to be our grass-specific uh, herbicides. And grasses have to be actively growing. These are systemic products. So you can't have grasses that are stressed due to water stress or temperature stress or some sort of other stress. Uh, perennial grasses are probably going to need repeat treatment. Don't confuse sedges with grasses. The WSSA1 herbicides are not gonna get things like nut sedge. They're not gonna get broadleaf, so they're gonna need broadleaf partners. This is gonna come down to Fusilade DX, which can only be used in non-bearing orchards, not in Long Island, and Sethoxidim, uh, which is for bearing and non-bearing systems. WSSA10, this is uh, glutamine synthase inhibitors. This is Rely 280 or glufosinate. It's better on broad leaves than grasses. So again, tank mix partner, not for use in Long Island. It's a contact herbicide. It does have a little bit of systemic movement, but do not treat it like a systemic herbicide. Do not confuse glufosinate with glyphosate. Glyphosate is a true systemic product. Glufosinate is not. So be very mindful of that and do not treat them similarly. Uh, glufosinate is, is going to need to be applied to very, very, very small weeds. The WSSA14, the PPO inhibitors that we consider to be more burn down herbicides and pre, uh, this is going to be AIM, carfentrazone. It's a contact herbicide, better on broad leaves than grasses. Weeds have got to be small. It's often used as a glyphosate partner. Same thing with venue. Contact herbicide must be applied to small weeds. Also glyphosate often used as a partner. Paraquat is the WSSA22. It's an electron diverter. Uh, a broad spectrum herbicide that sometimes is a little bit better under cloudy conditions because it, it acts on the photosystems and so, you know, photosynthesis, so it doesn't burn the, the plants as quickly. This is a restricted use contact herbicide. It needs smaller plants and there are new paraquat requirements that are associated with this product, um, particularly as of November 14th, 2019. There's updated labeling. Um, and uh, requirements for herbicide products and use, use requirements for products containing paraquat. Purchasers, applicators, mixers, or loaders, or tank cleaners need to be certified applicators and you must complete paraquat training every three years and get a 100% score on exam at the end of the training. I have been looking to see if New York State actually offers any kind of a paraquat training and I haven't found it yet. Uh, but if you go to extension.org, you should be able to get paraquat training or contact your local CCE um, personnel about opportunities if they know if it's going to be offered. 
uh, coming in November 2020, all containers of Paraquat, even less than 120 gallon drums, need to comply with closed system standards. So, so be aware of how Paraquat um, regulations are going to continue to change. Some general notes about post-emergent herbicides. Size matters and coverage counts. Even with our systemic products, we've got to make sure we get good coverage and we really need to be going after weeds when they are physically small. Weather and weed vigor can really impact herbicide performance. Weed vigor, particularly with our systemic herbicides, it might seem counterintuitive, but we want these plants actively growing so they can move these systemic herbicides around through all of the tissue. Perennials are gonna require multiple treatments. Pay attention to tree age and bearing restrictions. And remember that spray that comes into contact with stems, foliage, and blooms can cause injury. So I just wanna show you some kind of symptomology of injury. Uh, this is on cherry. The first picture is actually an ALS herbicide. Uh, ALS herbicides are going to show some leaf deformations. They're also going to show purpling of the veins and of the leaf tissue. By the way, all of these pictures I'm showing come from the UC IPM Herbicide Symptomology Gallery, and I'm going to be building a new one for New York starting this summer. We're going to put it online, uh, and hopefully we're going to have better, um, better quality high resolution images. The middle one is an example of injury from 2,4-D where you see those leaf distortions and the curling and twisting. But the one on the rightmost, that's glyphosate. And you might look at that and think, oh my God, the puckering, the distorting, you know, that kind of looks like 2,4-D. Yeah, it kind of does. Sometimes at really low rates, glyphosate can mimic 2,4-D injury on a lot of plants. And actually so can the ALS inhibiting herbicides. So we've got to be mindful of that, that there are symptoms and there are characteristic symptoms of injury due to herbicides, but, but sometimes depending on the rate, you know, it, it could be modified. And that's also another thing I'm really hoping to do is get different rates so we can really see the variability in the, the injury that can develop. So these are, this is injury, this is herbicide injury from glufosinate, paraquat, and PPO in order. And all of these herbicides, we talked about them being those herbicides that are gonna burn and cause tissue damage. This is spray diff damage. And again, you can see it might be a little hard to tell some of these apart. We know we've got a contact herbicide that's probably causing you know, tissue necrosis and death, but they all have that, that kind of you know, similar symptom. So sometimes it's gonna be hard to tell some of these products apart, but important to understand that this injury can occur you know, from herbicide contact to the trees. This is an interesting one that I want to point out, um, is that peaches, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure which ACCAs, which grass herbicides can cause this damage. I, I, I'm not sure it's all of them. And I think this injury is due to a grass herbicide called Halaxapop. But this is injury. So this is a grass herbicide on a broadleaf plant. We already talked that these herbicides aren't active on broad leaves, but this is damage to peaches from that grass herbicide. So, so understand that, you know, just because we're talking broad leaf plants doesn't mean that grass herbicides uh, can't cause some sort of symptomology. Weed size and herbicide injury to trees. This is an apple orchard in Washington state. Uh, this just gets to, to really getting getting weeds while they're young. If, if these weeds start growing, you're pulling the boom up, you're pulling the boom up, you've got more potential to cause damage to tree tissue. Uh, and then that's what you can see here where we, we have just burned those apple trees trying to, to, to manage the weeds that weren't managed early in the season. I do wanna talk about herbicide resistance. Um, Herbicide resistance is, is facing every single crop, so we have to be really, really aware of this in our perennial systems. Right now, this is the current state of herbicide resistance globally. 512 unique cases of herbicide resistance, 23 of our 26 known modes of action, and 166 different herbicides. So weeds aren't going away, and, and new strategies are always needed. Um, but herbicide resistance is gonna continue to threaten these tools. 
So this is actually resistant weeds in the US. And, and this was a slide I did for apples in New York, but it certainly applies here. This is herbicide resistant weeds um, by WSSA groups. Um, so this is the number of weeds around the world um, that are resistant um, to, to the herbicides that we're using in our tree crops. So you can see basically every herbicide class that I just talked about, every WSSA group, has some weeds somewhere in the world that have developed resistance to these products. Maybe we've only got a couple, but they're there. So no herbicide is really immune from the development of herbicide resistance. And this is gonna include our soil apply herbicides. This is not just something that's a hallmark of uh, the post products. If we wanna focus on the United States um, and we wanna focus on tree and vine systems around the world, we have 144 confirmed cases of herbicide resistance, 24 in the US, mostly in the Western US. Uh, so we have 13 species resistant to glyphosate, eight to photosystem two inhibitors, and two or fewer to paraquat, the grass herbicides, ALS inhibitors, and glufosinate. But these are the species that we've seen resistance developing to, and these are common to here. So we have to be aware. Uh, right now, this is herbicide resistance in New York, but I'm gonna tell you, uh, these three species haven't made it to the list, but we know we've got resistance. This is water hemp, palmer amaranth, and horseweed. We tend to think of, of these species as being resistant to, uh, you know, in our agronomic systems, that's horseweed and soybeans in New York, but that's palmer amaranth and almonds in California. So let's just be really mindful of, you know, herbicide resistance and weeds that are coming in. And, and that's my talk, and, and thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Lynn, that was really good. Okay, we do have one question, um, horseweed. We're having a hard time getting the timing right because we're, because we're finding, do you have a management strategy in terms of spring or fall spraying for horseweed? Okay, so horseweed is a great question and this is a problem um, and so the thing with horseweed is we've got to get very, very, very small rosettes. As soon as they start to get, you know, with post-emergent products, as soon as we start to get size on them, they start to become resistant you know, or just more tolerant of, of the weeds and of our herbicide applications in general. And, and, and here's a problem that I'm concerned about. I don't know yet here what, what the emergence pattern looks like. Um, it, it, so with the fall emergence, if, if we're getting it up in fall and then we're getting uh, rosettes coming up in spring, what I'm thinking is we have some of those fall rosettes hardening off and they are becoming much more difficult to, to control in the spring. Maybe you're burning down spring emerging rosettes pretty easily, but those fall ones, not so much. So we have to be thinking about, you know, fall, if we've got rosettes coming up in the fall, fall burn down applications, uh, residual, uh, products that, that can be used to su suppress horseweed. Um, and then again, clean up, clean up in the spring. Um, thank you everyone for your time. And thanks especially to the presenters, um, to Art, Carrick, and Lynn. That was really interesting. So yes, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you all again for joining us. Thank you very much, Mike and Janet and everyone for attending.